For my message today, I speak on the subject entitled, Standing in the Gap. Standing in the Gap for the Land. And I wish to read from Ezekiel chapter 22, and verse number 30, as follows in Jesus' name. And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge, and stand in the gap before me for the land, that I should not destroy it, but I found none. And then another scripture found in Isaiah the prophet, the 59th chapter and verse number 16, And he that is God saw that there was no man, and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore his arm brought salvation unto him, and his righteousness it sustained him. Shall we bow, please, for prayer? Almighty, eternal God, I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that you will bless every man and every woman, every boy and every girl watching this telecast, Somewhere across the world, I pray, Father, that you will bless and strengthen, save and heal, and that you will stir every Christian to realize that we have a job to be done. We must do it now. We must do it quickly before it's too late. In Jesus' name, and for God's glory, with much thanksgiving, amen and amen. I want to share a very hard-hitting message a message that has stirred my soul, that has touched my life very deeply, and I hope it will touch your life the same way. Standing in the gap. What is all this about? Well, in the book of Ezekiel, the Bible says God sought for a man. And God is still searching for men, men and women who will serve him, who will live for him, who will work for him, men and women who will take their place seeking out those who are less fortunate, those who are unsaved, those who are sick and suffering, those who need help. And God is looking for people who are workers. You know, the only hands that Jesus has are your hands and mine. He has no hands but our hands, no feet but our feet, and no voice but our voice. Of course, he, His voice is the Word of God. This is the voice of God. This is the voice of God to you today the voice of God, speaking to you. And here's what God's voice is saying. I'm still looking for men and women. I'm still looking for a man who will stand in the gap, who will make up the hedge for me. What was God saying? God was saying that the world was filled with wickedness. Sin was on every hand. And God was going to destroy the world. So he sought for a man, someone to stand in the gap, someone to make up the hedge, Someone to stand between a holy God and sinful man. But he didn't find anyone. He searched heaven. He sought among the angels. They couldn't do it because they had never sinned. They didn't know what it was like to be a man. They were perfect, but they didn't understand humanity. He looked among the prophets. He sought for someone. But even though they were good men and holy men, they were born in sin. They couldn't stand in the presence of God. And so God had to send His only Son. And Jesus Christ, the Son of God, God the Son became a man, wrapped in human flesh, so that He might stand in the gap, so that He might be that God-man. And when Jesus Christ came down from heaven, He came to seek and to save the lost. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him. And with his stripes, we are healed. He came to redeem mankind. He came to stand in the gap. We know that God couldn't use a man, an ordinary man, because we were sinners, born in sin and shape and in iniquity. But Jesus, the very Son of God, he came to take our place. He died for you. He's your substitute. He was wounded for you, bruised for you, chastised for you and striped for you. And he stood in the gap. 
He took the hand of God in one hand on the cross. He reached down and took the hand of man in the other hand. And he brought God and man together at the cross. Oh, I love that. The word of God is so strong and so powerful. And the love of God is so great. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. What was God wanting to do? He was wanting to redeem the world. He couldn't do it by himself. There was no way God could do it. He was too holy. Why, if God would have come down to earth and said to man, I want to love you and I want to save you, his holiness would have destroyed us because we are too sinful. So Jesus had to become a man. A man who was born without sin. A man who was perfect. He was the God-man. And he came down, as I said earlier, he brought God and man together at the cross. In the book of Isaiah, the 59th chapter, verse number 16, the Bible says, And God saw that there was no man, and wondered that there was no intercessor. You know, God wonders when we don't care. God is actually wondering why the children of men are so callous and so unkind and so uncaring. Why we don't have a burden for people. And God saw that there was no man and he wondered that no, there was no intercessor. Therefore his arm brought salvation unto him and his righteousness, it sustained him. God himself provided our salvation. You know, the Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God not of works lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship. We are his workmanship. We can't save ourselves. We can't purchase our own salvation. We can't buy a home in heaven through our good works or our money or our good deeds or through who we think we are. Our righteousness are as filthy rags before God. Only by the grace of God, only through the mercy of God, only by the love of God can we even approach him. You know, the Bible says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. And I'm absolutely thrilled that God looked down upon you and me and he loved us. Why would God want to love us? We were unlovable. We were evil. We were sinful. We were unrighteous. We were like the prodigal son in the far country. But God came to us. And the Bible says, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now he wants us to stand in the gap for others. He wants us to call upon his name. He wants us to be soul winners. He wants us to lift up the fallen. He wants us to take this gospel to all mankind everywhere. For he said, In the Great Commission, Go ye into all the world. All the world to your neighbors, and preach the gospel unto every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. Those who believe in me, said Jesus. They shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. Think about that. We can have the power of God in our lives. We can work for God. And Jesus said in his word, John chapter 4 and verse 35, Say not ye there are yet four months, and then come of the harvest. He said, Lift up your eyes to the fields, and look under the fields, for they are white already under harvest. And then he talks about wages, rewards. You and I will be rewarded. If we continue... The Bible says, He that goeth forth and weepeth and beareth precious seed shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. There is a payday. We will reap what we have sown. The Bible says, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. God will pay us. There will be a payday. Jesus said, I must work the works of my Father while there is day. For night cometh when no man shall be able to work. Now we can work. We can work now. I love the old song. Nothing in my hands I bring. 
Simply to thy cross I cling. Oh, take me as I am. My only plea, Christ died for me. Oh, take me as I am. So we come to him just as I am without one plea. But that thy blood was shed for me and that thou bidst me come to thee. O Lamb of God, I come. I come. So we come just as we are. We are nothing. We have nothing. We'll amount to nothing. Only by the grace of God. Only by the blood of Christ. For the Bible says, without the shedding of the blood, there is no remission for sins. No forgiveness. It is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. And the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sins. So we come and we receive. For by grace, unmerited favor. For by the grace of God are you saved. How? Through our faith in Christ and the finished work of Calvary. But once we are saved, we must go with the message. We must run with the message. They came to the tomb early in the morning. On the third day, women came to the tomb. The men were hiding. They were afraid. Jesus had been crucified. Their Lord and Savior had been nailed upon a cross. And now the women went to the tomb. And they were met by angels, an angelic host. Angels of God. The soldiers, the guards who were guarding the tomb lay like dead men. And the angels said, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here. Don't be afraid. I know who you seek. You seek Jesus. He was crucified. He was dead. But he's not dead anymore. He's alive forevermore. Why do you seek the living among the dead? And then he said, come and see the place where the Lord lay. If you want an answer, if you're sincere, you'll find an answer in this book. Because God will give you the answer if you're sincere. If you're just playing games, if you're just making fun, making light of these things, if you're just trying to study the Bible to be critical, you'll find things to be critical of. But if you will turn to the Word of God, and if you'll be honest and sincere, He'll give you an answer. The angel said, come and see the place where the Lord lay. And then when they went to see, and they saw He was gone, the grave clothes were lying there. The soldiers were lying like dead men on the ground. The tomb was empty. Christ was gone. Then the angel said, Now that you've seen, now go and tell. Our duty is to come and see, and then go and tell. First we come and see. We receive from the hand of God. Our sins are forgiven. They're washed away. We lay ourselves on the altar of sacrifice. We say an eternal yes to God. We say, Christ, I believe. I believe. Je crois in French. Je crois, I believe. In Ukrainian, ya viru. Ya viru. In Norwegian, ya tror. I believe. I believe the Holy Bible is the sacred word of God. It shall lead me to the fountains where the saints of earth have trod. And with faith in my Redeemer, I shall see the ages roll in the place that he has promised. It is heaven for the soul. I believe. I love the confession of faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sat down the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From whence he shall come to rapture the church and to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen and amen. Come and see. And once you've come and seen, then it's your obligation, it's your duty to go and tell someone else. Jesus said, lift up your eyes. Look to the fields. The fields are already white. 
He said, don't say there are still four months and then come with the harvest. He said, I say unto you, lift up your eyes, look to the field. He said, the fields are already white. You know, our problem is we get our eyes on human things. He said, don't look at the fields of barley and corn and wheat, but look to the field that is the world, the world that is lost. Standing in the gap, that means you must begin to pray fast, seek God. Testify. Give. Are you prepared to stand in the gap? He's still looking for a man, someone to make up the heads, someone to say, I'll do it, Lord. I'll go where you want me to go. I'll say what you want me to say. I'll be what you want me to be. I'll be that man. I'll stand in the gap. I'll pray. I'll fast. I'll give that special missionary offering. I'll do it. I'll testify. I'll be a missionary in my family. I'll be a missionary in my home. I'll talk to those that I rub shoulders with. I'll testify for Christ. I'll live the life. I'll do that which he's asked me to do. Don't be a hypocrite. Don't be a liar. Don't be an adulterer. Don't be a thief. Don't be a homosexual. But be a Christian. A Christian with a testimony. Be a man, a woman, a boy, a girl on fire for God and with His Spirit. There's a scripture I want to refer you to. It's in the book of Romans. It's powerful. It is so powerful that when I read it, I am literally trembling in God's presence. Let me read it to you from the ninth chapter of Romans. St. Paul writing to the pagan people, now Christian. To the church at Rome, the former pagans, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have a great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ, my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. When I first read that, I wondered if Paul had made a mistake. I wondered if I was really understanding what I was reading. Why would Paul use five testimonies, five witnesses to prove that he's telling the truth? Certainly if all, of all men Paul should be telling the truth, we know he wouldn't lie. And I read it again and again and again, and I discovered that the message was so heavy, it was so powerful, that he had to use five witnesses to prove that he was telling the truth. Witness number one, I say the truth. Witness number two, I say it in Christ. Witness number three, I lie not. Witness number four, my conscience bears me witness. Witness number five, the Holy Ghost bears me witness. It was so heavy, it was so powerful, it was so strong that Paul needed five witnesses to be able to back him up so that no one would doubt the message. It was so much, so heavy duty. What was he saying? He was saying, my conscience bears me witness. The Holy Ghost bears me witness. I'm not lying to you. I'm telling the truth. I'm saying it in Christ. What was the message? It's in verse number 2 and verse 3 that I have continual sorrow in my heart. I have a great heaviness and a continual sorrow in my heart for my Jewish people, my kinsmen, my neighbors, my relatives. And then he drops a bombshell. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ from my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. He is saying that if it was possible for me to bring them to Christ, I would be willing to be accursed from Christ forever, to be lost, to go to hell, to suffer the pangs of the doomed and the damned forever, to go to a living hell forever. Paul believed in hell. He preached about it. 
He said, if it was possible for me to win my people, to turn them to God by me taking their place, by me, myself, going to hell so that they wouldn't have to, I would do it. That's pretty heavy duty. I remember when I was first converted. I prayed for my brother Fred. I prayed for him again and again. I prayed God save my brother Fred. I'd write him letters. I'd call him. He wasn't interested. He and I had been so close. And then the Lord spoke to me and said, Max, what would you do? What would you be willing to do to cause your brother to come to Christ? I said, anything. And then the word came to me, would you be willing now that you're saved? If this would be the only thing that would bring him to his senses, would you be willing for me to take you home? Would you be willing to die? If only your death would stir him so much that, would, that he would repent and come to God. I said, oh no. Oh no, I wouldn't be willing for that. I would not be willing. And I prayed and prayed, and every time I prayed, God was saying to me, what would you be willing to pay? Would you be willing to die? I said, no. And one day in prayer, finally, suddenly I heard myself say, if that's the only thing that would shock him and rock him, bring him to his senses, I'd be willing to do it. And all of a sudden, the burden lifted off my heart. And I didn't feel like praying for him anymore. The same way. And a short while later, I heard that he had quit drinking. And then I heard that he was really quite open to the gospel. And today, my brother Fred believes. I had to be willing. And now Paul could never go to hell for the Jews. Only one could do that, and that was Jesus Christ. He was the only one who could die. The only one who could shed his blood. The only one who could pay the supreme sacrifice. Why? Because his blood, his blood was holy. Without sin, uncontaminated. And he was the only one. And he did shed his blood for you and for me. He did take our place. He is our substitute. He did go to hell for us. Paul couldn't do it. But Paul was willing to do it. That's the important thing. The great burden of the gospel. He was willing to go to hell. A man who loved the Lord with all of his heart was willing to go to hell? Not me. I haven't come to that place yet. I doubt if I ever will. I don't think I would ever go to hell for anybody. But he was prepared and ready to do it. And he gives five witnesses to prove it. In the book of Romans, the 10th chapter. We read in verse 1, Brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. What do we pray about? We pray for ourselves, for our loved ones. Oh, Lord, bless, um, you know, mom and dad and John and Sue and we four and no more. We are concerned about the people within the four walls of our church. We're concerned about our relatives and our friends. But what about the pagan? What about the poor and the needy? The Hindu, the Muslim, the Buddhist, the Shintoist, the Shanguist, the New Age movement advocates. Do we, are we concerned about them? I'll be leaving in a little while. This year, I'll be going to Romania. Romania, I've taken the gospel all over the world. 26 years, I've left my wife and my family. I've seen them stand there and weep as I would leave. I've cried myself to sleep on the mission fields. I have literally been so lonely that I have wept again and again. I'm writing a book called My Heaviest Cross, how that I've had to give up my family for so many years to go away month after month, week after week. But this is nothing to what Christ did. He left heaven's glory. He came from glory. He laid aside the power, the authority. He became sin for us. He became a man, and upon the cross he became sin so that he could die for you and for me. What are we, what are we willing to do? What are you willing to do? Jesus challenges us. He says, go ye in all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. These signs shall follow them that believe. 
in the book of Romans, the first chapter, the Bible says, St. Paul says, I am a debtor. I owe it to all men. I owe it to the barbarian. I owe it to the Greek to preach the gospel to them. And I feel the same way. And I'll be leaving very soon. Leaving to go to Bucharest. We expect to preach in a large square. It's the central square. You've seen the pictures on television. The great uh, rebellion, the uprising, the revolution in Romania. In Timoshwara, I've been there. I preached to 8,000 there on a given Sunday. One Sunday last May. I preached in Oradio. I've been all through uh, Poland and Russia preaching the gospel. I go back this year, August, the last week in August, the first week in September, I go back to preach the gospel. They're giving us the large central square. 